all the villages across. The great story of America is not individuals. They're not lonely cowboys. It's the building of villages and towns and cities. And when you built a village in the Middle West, let's say, my wife is from Iowa, the city depended in part on some people of enterprise who figured out a business that would be attractive for people in the area, could serve a mill, for example. Um, a mill in the sense of a lumber yard, but a mill in the sense of a place that could grind grain, storage bins for grain, uh, building places that would try to attract the railroad to find markets or to get things to the Mississippi so they could sail down to markets, opening up markets. You depended on people who knew how to do this, and they were great heroes. If you go across Europe and visit schools, most of the oil portraits on the walls or dukes, or counts, maybe the bishop, uh, often soldiers, generals. If you go into an American school, they're mostly the businessmen and women who serve on the board, or who are fathers of the village or the town to whom everybody is indebted. They don't, not everybody in the town depends on them, but they provide a core. To, is enough to attract a whole village and hold it uh, over uh, many years. This is a very social country, but the kind of social society it is is not the kind of Europe. And very few thinkers have captured the difference. When many people say social, social even soli solidarity, the images they have come out of the life of Europe. And that's fine. It was a beautiful continent once. It's on its way to destruction now, but it was beautiful once and uh, in, it produced immense works of beauty. And it's a great place to live. I mean, if you want a long afternoon with a cafe and a good chocolate, there's no better place in the world to have long, leisurely afternoons. Um, Montaigne pointed out in the 17th century that the condition of the poor in Europe had been unchanged since the time of Christ. St. Thomas Aquinas walked between Rome and Paris and back three times, six times in all. How else were you going to get there? On a mule, maybe. Parts of it, maybe, on a carriage. First trains didn't run until 1828, I think it is, somewhere around there. First automobiles, much later. First airplanes, later than that. And the poor lived pretty much as they had in the time of Christ. The basic economy was rural and agricultural. And in that, there was enough to stay ahead of hunger and famine and to prune trees and develop them and make vineyards over years and so forth. But there wasn't much way to see progress for the whole family or for the whole people. That wasn't even the dream until Adam Smith. In 1800, there's estimated to have been 760 million people on Earth, and almost all of them would be characterized as very poor. Thomas Jefferson visiting France for the first time, the country of Les Miserables, said American slaves live better than the poor of France. Eat better. Um, have more sustenance. It's this world that Adam Smith set out to see if we couldn't change. By grasping that wealth can be created in certain systematic ways. If you learn how to organize, if you learn how to train the brain, the mind, immense wealth can be created. If you look around in this room, the hardwood or artificial hardwood that we are sitting on, this plywood, this, the electric lights, the seats you are sitting in, um, didn't exist in 1776 or 1787. They were invented. And the people who invented them gave us great gifts, and incidentally, they become very rich. They became very rich. 
because if you only get a penny from each of these chairs, it, it mounts up. Um, so there are now 6 Point two billion people on the planet 200 years later and 4 billion of them have been lifted out of poverty. There are about 2 billion more who are $2 a day or less and that's our task. We did very a lot in uh, 200 years and it can go a lot faster now. In the last 20 years alone in China and India by turning to capitalist methods invention, discovery, enterprise, allowing free reign to individuals instead of the state directing everything. China and India have lifted 500 million people, half a billion, out of poverty. Asia was the poorest part of the world 30 years ago, no longer. It's jumped ahead of Africa and Latin America. And it's going to go booming, and this is probably going to be the Asian century. Now, I've, I've mentioned the essential point of capitalism. It's the system organized, organized around the human mind, around invention and discovery. You're expected when you do a thesis at an American university to come up with something new, an invention. Not so in Latin America. You're expected to represent a poetic tradition or a literary tradition very well. Not the novelty of it. It's the classic nature of it that you're organized to. Here it's very different. It's no accident that if a European opens up his medicine chest, 80% of all the products in it were invented in America. Well, you look around the kitchens of the technology, except for some German things and some Dutch things, almost the rest is invented in America, and now increasingly imitated and improved uh, by the Japanese. The forgotten dynamic of this system called this kind of political economy is the spirit. And as uh, Professor Clark pointed out, this is something which Adam Smith had already written about but was forgotten in his introduction to the moral sentiments. He described the, the moral dimensions that are essential to this system. Now, this, uh, the aim of this system is to bring about three liberations, just to repeat myself a little bit. Liberation from poverty, I've already mentioned, through the economy, through a new sort of economy. Liberation from torture and tyranny through a new kind of polity, a republic, a republic of liberty, as Lincoln called it. By the way, Lincoln insisted on the Homestead Act because he wanted the new territories of the West open and settled by individual families becoming artists of their own property and inventing and discovering. And to help this, he insisted that every new territory, before it could become a same state, had to have technical and agricultural schools. Texas A&M and, and so forth. In almost every state, there's a university and there's a state school, including usually agriculture and other, other uh, fields. Because, why did he do that? Because he understood that the cause of wealth is intellect. I did, he said this beautifully at his address to the Wisconsin State, state Fair in 1858 and in other places too. He thought one of the great steps forward, one of the six greatest steps forward in the history of liberty was the patent and copyright clause, which gave to authors and inventors, at least for a defined period, the right to the fruits of their own inventions or creations. By a stroke of a pen, the Congress changed the basis of wealth in the world. No longer land, inherited land, orchards, but now ideas. People who came up with new ideas could become much wealthier than, than farmers and do far more good, far more to advance the common good than could ever be done before, even imagined before.